Good morning. Let us bow for a word of prayer. O oh, gracious and eternal God, we give you all the praises this morning for allowing us to sleep and arise and see another glorious day. We ask special blessings on our sick and our shut-in members, our bereaved members, and we also ask special blessings on those that are viewing this morning. We ask prayer for our pastor and his wife and our entire church family. We want to give you all the praises because you are power and omnipotent. In these names I pray, amen. amen. Our topic for this morning is Christ is Wisdom. Our devotional reading comes from Psalm 16. Our background scriptures, Revelations 2, 1 through 7, Acts 19, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Our printed passage, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Our key verse is Ephesians 1 and 18, and it states, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Our author is the Apostle Paul, written around A.D. 62 towards the end of Paul's life, written to the church in Ephesus. The purpose Ephesians show believers who they are in Christ and encourage them to walk accordingly. A key persons are Paul, a Jewish rabbi, and Pharisees who later converted to Christianity. And Barnabas was ordained by the church in Antioch and sent faith to preach the gospel. He was the founder of several churches which are found in the New Testament. Some key terms are inheritance, and it is defined as a heritage, property, received or to be received, something awarded by divine lot. No is defined as to be aware, behold, consider, and perceive. Knowledge is defined as recognition, perception, and a revelation. Prayers are defined as prayers to God, petitions. Thanks is defined as thankfulness, gratitude, and thanksgiving. Wisdom is defined as skill, human or divine, insight, and intelligence. The historical setting of the lesson, it is generally believed that Ephesians will have been written A.D. 60 and A.D. 63 during his first two years imprisonment in Rome, Acts 28, 16. There would have been many opportunities for persons to visit and receive his letters and carry them back to various congregations Paul founded. Paul mentioned his imprisonment and how Jesus Christ has become known throughout the Praetorian God, Philippians 12 through 14. Prior to Paul's visit there was no established Christian church there. Paul visited Ephesus for the first time during his second missionary journey, Acts 15, 40, 18, 22. Paul had a brief stay in Ephesus after spending 18 months in Corinth, Acts 18, 11. During his brief stay in Ephesus, he was accompanied by Aquila and Priscilla, whom he left there. Paul spent some time meeting with Jewish elders. There's no record that he started a church. Acts 18, 
19 through 20. More than likely, the church was started by Aquila and Priscilla, who remained after he departed for Caesarea. When he departed, Paul promised to return to Ephesus if the Lord's will it to be so. Acts 18, 21. Upon his return, Paul spent three years in Ephesus doing his third missionary journey, Acts 19. It was during this trip that he had his greatest success in Ephesus, Acts 19. He encountered some major challenges to his preaching of the gospel. The geographical and cultural setting of the lesson. In the book of Revelation, there are seven letters written to seven churches. Revelations 2 to 22. The letters to the church in Ephesus was written first because of the city's prominence in the region. The city of Ephesus had one of the greatest seaports of the ancient world. Ephesus was a city with a population made up of people from around the Mediterranean world. Ephesus was home to many wealthy, aristocratic people. The city was noted for his school of philosophy and rhetorics, making it a center of education. Ephesus was at the center of paganism and idol worship, especially the worship of Optimus and Diana, Acts 19, 27 through 28. The church in Ephesus was one of the most notable churches of the first century, one of the most believed important Christian to Tarsus, and letters were written to the church there the letters of the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Our introduction, saints praying for saints. The most difficult thing to get the saints of God to come together to do is to pray. Prayer is our greatest spiritual weapon. Great things begin to happen among God's people when we pray. In each of Paul's letters to various churches in the New Testament, Paul reminded the people that he was praying for them. To the church in Rome, Paul wrote, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Romans 1 and 9. To the church in Corinth, he wrote, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 and 4. All Paul letters, there resounds a saint praying for other saints. Prayer is the greatest spiritual weapon at the church disposal. Paul concluded his writing to the church in Ephesus about the need of putting on the whole armor of God. The last thing that he told the church to do is pray always. No Christian will benefit from spiritual warfare who does not understand the necessity of prayer. Jesus understood the power of prayer especially intercessory prayer. In John 17, he prayed not only for himself, but also for his disciples that they might be one, as he and the Father are one. Jesus is seated in the heavenly place and has the authority of heaven vested in himself. He sits on the throne as Lord and Savior. Paul's prayer of thanksgiving, verses 15 through 16. Paul indicated that he had been praying for saints in Ephesus. 
he received a report that the Ephesians had heard the truth of the gospel, believed and were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Paul often commended the church for the positive report he received after them, Colossians 1 and 4, Philemon 5, Romans 1 and 5. Ephesians had demonstrated their faith in the Lord Jesus and their hearts were filled with love for all the saints. Love for each is the one virtue that Jesus said would characterize his disciples, John 13, 34 through 35. In verse 16, he reminded them that they will always be the object of his prayers. Colossians 1 and 9, Romans 1 and 9, 2 Timothy 1 and 3, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2. The greatest witness of the people of God to the redemptive power of God is love for the saints and faith in him. Our love for each other reveals the depth of our faith in the transformative power of God. Paul's prayer of intercession, verse 17. It begins with a lofty statement about God. He is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, John 20, 17. His glory is a reflection of his splendor, majesty, and power. 1 Chronicles 2, 11, Psalms 24 and 7, 10, 29 and 3. In verse 18, Paul sets forth his position on the Ephesians' behalf. First, that God will give them the spirit of wisdom and uh, revelation. The spirit of wisdom is a disposition that enables the believers to comprehend divine truth. Revelations mean to reveal what has been hidden. What is the purpose of this spirit of wisdom and uh, revelation? It has but one goal that they would have knowledge of him as he is revealed in the word of God. Paul prayed that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Paul wanted the believers in Ephesus to have spiritual eyes so they could see the manifestation of God's power and comprehend the blessed hope we have in Jesus Christ. Psalms 119, 18, Luke 24, 45. Titus 2.13. It is possible to be saved and not see the hand of God at work in the life of the local church. Satan can dull the sense and blind us to God's awesome power. Hebrews 6 and 4, 10 and 32. Believers have a holy calling and the calling is for God's purpose. Paul prays for God's great power, verses 19 to 23. In this portion of the prayer, Paul turned from intercession to praise. Paul uses four superlatives in his description of God's power. Number one, exceeding, and it means to go beyond surpassing. 2 Corinthians 3 and 10, 9, 14, Ephesians 2 and 7, 3 and 19. Number two, greatness. It means quality of exceeding a standard involving physical magnitude size. Number three, power. It denotes the capacity to do anything, outward power and influence. Number four, Working means the state of quality of being active, working, operation, actions. It is the power of God that infuses the people of God with the capacity to do the great work of missions and ministry. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, 28, 19 through 20. We experience 
God's power as we do the work of God. Our churches lack the power to effect change. It is because they are not doing the work of God. In verse 20, it states that God's power is at work and visible in raising Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Romans 6, 5 through 11, Philippians 3 and 10. Not only was Jesus raised from the dead, but also after ascension, he was seated at the right hand of God. In verse 21 to 23, these verses are the expression of pinnacles of the power and authority that God has invested in Jesus Christ. He reigns supreme above all principalities and power and mighty and dominion and every name that is named. There is no power greater than the power of God. He supersedes all other and is beyond all principalities power, might, and dominion. All things have been made subject to him, and he is the head of all things that pertain to the church. The power that God the Father has invested in Jesus is available to the church, which is the living incarnation of Jesus in the world today. The church is his body, a term often used by Paul to describe the organism of the church. God, ecclesis, are those who have been gathered by God for his purpose. The apostle Peter wrote that the church is made up of those whom God has called out of darkness. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2 and 9. God has called us to be individuals and corporate proclaimers of his goodness and mercy. Every time we witness or talk about God's importance in our lives, we are witnessing. In closing... Number one, prayer is one of the principal responsibility of every believer. Number two, we must pray for each other and for the work that God is doing in the lives of others. Number three, the church is the product of the intentional working of God the Father. Number four, the church, which is the body of Christ, is not a standalone entity without any corresponding obligations to follow and obey Jesus Christ. Number five, the church is subject to Jesus Christ in everything. He is her head and one whose authority uh, transcends all others. And finally, <clears throat> number six. Christians are all members of Jesus' body, the church. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Thank you.